actually gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce my dear friend, Mario Romero Ortega. Um, we met a few years ago through a DARPA meeting and hit it off, and uh, we've kind of been interacting ever since, and uh, he's a great guy, and does excellent and beautiful work. So, um, you know, to start with, um, he's got a um, he has a BS or a BS degree at the University of Guadalajara, and then a PhD at Tulane, and then he did his um, postdoctoral study at UT Southwestern, and then it was in the Center for Developmental Biology, and then also this one's a mouthful. This is the Kent Waldrop Foundation Center for Basic Science Research and Nerve Growth and Regeneration. So, um, and then you know, just as a person, um, Mario, it's it's very cool. He's, he's um, one of these kind of rare people who's uh, it, what you know. It's essentially a scientific polymath across. He, he has a, a, a very distinct mastery of many different types of disciplines, from development to engineering to basic science or to, to, to biology. Um, and, and so, you know, he, he interacts and, and engages with all of these different fields in, in, in very clear, very salient ways. And, you know, I see you know, he's got all these different memberships to these societies, but it really boils down to, you know, his skill set can be really boiled down into the journals that he reviews for. And he reviews, you know, the, you know science. Journal of Neuroengineering, yeah, everybody does that. But you know, beyond the engineering, and we're actually talking about behavioral brain research, so now we're talking about behavior and neuroscience, we're looking at developmental brain, or developmental biology, so he also is a molecular geneticist and does have a background in development, and cuts into you know, neurochemistry, nanotechnology, frontiers in neuroscience, you know, so he's actually able to contribute to all of these different fields in a very strong way. So he's also published in, um, cell, re in cell Research, in Nature Journal, um, Frontiers in Neuroengineering, Nature Nanotechnology, um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and also in Neurons. So these are you know, pretty serious journals as well. And um, he's got a successful funding track record, NIH, the GSK Initiative, and also in DARPA. And then um, holds many patents and disclosures and applications as well. And then you know he's also someone who's really respected in the field. And so he's given TED Talks. Um, he's been in the New York Times, and he's also, um, I there? Yep. and then he's also received the Tech Titans Award. So, you know, one of the neat things is you can have a great conversation with him across science, but you know, we can also switch immediately as a family, and we can switch into music, you know, and then we can have conversations about fantasy as well. So this oh. is all very cool stuff. <clears throat> so with that, I'll turn it over to Mario. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it's fantastic to be, to be here. And um, it's, I have to tell you, that's probably, without a doubt, the best introduction I have ever had. And I don't know if I can live to that <laughs> level of expectations that are now you raised. But um, it's fantastic to be, to be here. I, I respect a lot of uh, many of you in, that are in the room. I respect the, the work that you do. And it's just, as I said, a privilege to be here. I'll, I'll be talking today of uh, biologically inspired strategies for peripheral neural interfaces and how I got there from being a basic neuroscientist. So um, first let me tell you what my lab does. I, I always have been interested in, in evaluating how neurons make decisions, where they decide to grow, where they decide uh, when, when they shouldn't grow, or when they fail to grow when in situations that we wish they were. For example, there are situations in which we have nerve injuries and uh, in some of these cases, when the, there is a gap and the gap is sufficiently large, then some of these neurons fail to regenerate, even though they have the capability to do, so, to do so. So part of my lab looks at the strategies to make these neurons find their proper targets. On the other extreme, extreme you will have situations in which neurons grow in undesirable ways. They create painful neuromas. And, and so another part of my lab looks at ways to prevent that from happening and prevent the pain that is associated with it. And right, probably right in the middle is where I, I place the neural interfaces, because there are neural interfaces are, uh, at least the, the approach that I take is uh, particularly in the sense that I want some fibers to grow to particular places. And I'll, I'll explain why that in a minute. But I also think about inhibitors to block some of those fibers as well. And I hope that as, as I talk, those strategies become a little bit more clear to you. Today, what I'll talk about is, I'll, first of all, the biological inspiration, how neurons regenerate and mature, and how that contributes to the development of this uh, new type of interface that I call regenerative multi electrode interface, or REMIs. Our, the second one is, is how our knowledge of uh, axon guidance and target recognition has 
influence our thinking and how to modify the, the remis to be to, to come and produce something that I call Y remis in a way that I can perhaps imagine a way in which you can entice neurons or sensory subtypes to go to particular compartments in that way uh, create a more selective perhaps a new interface. The third biologically inspired uh, example I'm going to talk about is this fascicular neural interface. And the, the idea there is that all these peripheral nerves, many of them are composed by multiple fascicles, and fascicles are distinct. So the idea will be to perhaps interface with, directly with those fascicles to achieve a little more selectivity. This is a slide that I was thinking well, that, that I know you don't need, but I'll still show you. <laughs> and, and this is just to remind you that the peripheral neuron, that, that the uh, upper limb prosthetics changed dramatically in the last 15 years, or particularly the last 10 years, with a lot of funding from DARPA. And so what you have now is a multi-articulated um, hand that can mimic all movements of the natural human hand, which could be heavily sensorized. And so the challenge really becomes in terms of how to provide an interface so you can voluntarily move that prosthesis and also receive this proper sensory information from those sensors in a way that you perceive that as your natural hand. There have been the inspiration of most of this work, I think, comes from Hollywood, where this uh, movie influenced a lot of the thinking about how you can probably uh, connect these interfaces. Obviously, you can go to the brain, and, and there are people who have done that very, very successfully. But um, you can directly place uh, wires into the peripheral nerve of chronic amputees and uh, stimulate um, the nerve and evoke sensation. And you can also record from them as well. And these are familiarized examples for you, both in um, Lausanne as well as here, examples of electrodes that are placed in uh, amputees and demonstrated to work in terms of recording and stimulating uh, fibers. Now, it's not only those interfaces that we know. There are at least 11 types that I know uh, that can be grouped in different clusters. One could be uh, the less invasive cough all the way to the more invasive regenerative uh, type. Um, these different types of interface are not only different flavors and different architectures, but they also give you different functionalities. So um, the less invasive ones are fantastic because they last, last four decades, and that's primarily the work that you guys do here. The, the, the limitation, perhaps, is the fact that you get compound nerve potentials. You don't get individual single spikes, and that may be or may not be a limitation depending on how you look at these things. But as you move from the less invasive to the most invasive, particularly from the uh, indwelling multi-electro rays or the regenerative ones, the idea is that you're going to get closer and closer to the axon fibers. And perhaps you can, not not perhaps, the fact is that you can actually see single spikes and, and get better signal to noise ratio. So that is the motivation. And this is, obviously an, this is an option for both intact and, and amputated nerves. This is definitely not an option, in my view, for non-amputated nerves, not injured nerves, right? This will be OK for an interface of uh, amputees, but not for not injured nerves. Also, so what is our motivation, and how do we get involved in this field? Well, peripheral nerves are composed of multiple fascicles. These fascicles are composed of axons, and these axons are of different sizes. They're large, myelinated, medium size with less myelination. And you have a bunch of. Uh, small, unmyelinated, and cheated axons. So all of these, even though they vary from 2 microns all the way to 14 or 20 microns, if you take into account the myelin, myelin as they regenerate through a sieve electrode, and this is kind of an SEM picture showing that, they all will extend their axon, um, which at the growth cone will probably measure between 1 and 3 microns. So they can pass through those holes fairly easy, and, they, and many of them go through one of those 40 micron um, perforations at once. As they mature, though, they will enlarge. They go from this size to that size. They will myelinate. And as they do so, they will constrict themselves as they enlarge because the space will not expand. So that was the first observation that we thought, well, maybe we can do a little bit better. If they will be knowing that, the question was, can you develop an interface that will allow that maturation process to occur without and still get the axons to, to, to grow in close proximity to the electroarrays? And the thought that we, that we had was to buy a, a commercially available electrode, the floating microelectroarray, which is shown here. It has 18 uh, platinum electrodes, and we encase those into a uh, PTF 
E tubing. You can also do that with silicone. And then attach at one end of the transsector nerve, shown here, the proximal end. And then put the distal end here and, and fill the space with the electrodes with collagen, thereby providing this extracellular matrix for axons to grow. We tested that in animals in the sciatic nerve, so basically right there we cut and place the interface. And this is how it, show, how it looks basically 45 days or two months after. But this, is, um, this picture was taken after I removed all the fibrotic tissue that covers the tube. Basically when, when you first open the animal, everything is encapsulated and that electrode not only is fixed to the tube, but the tube is actually very f well fixed and anchored to, um, uh, to the adjacent muscle. So it, this interface don't, re don't really move much at all. That's just a picture of the electrode. What we observe is that, or you expect, is that neurons will grow from the time that you place that interface over a month and two months, and progressively these axons are gonna grow, and they go through, through a couple of stages. It's a two-stage um, growth process. And uh, if you take this nerve and after a month or two months and look at the tissue, this is what you see. Uh, the asterisk shows the place of uh, what was occupied by the electrode. There is a lot of cells that are surround. These are stained by DAPI. And then the green and the red are, uh, green is NF200, it's labeled for axons, and the red is P0, which is labeled for myelin. What you can see is there's a lot of axons that basically encounter in their path an, an, an electrode, and it basically go around it and continue to grow. Those, uh, those, new, those cells here are macrophages, as you can see here. This is, an acronal, this is a coronal section, this is a sagittal section. And so you can see the ED1 label macrophages coating the electrode. And this is a nice fascicle that reform nearby. You can do that in an acute preparation or chronic preparation. This is six months after the injury. I took the nerve and um, implanted the REMI. This is a picture of the middle in both the acute and the chronic preparation. And the green is NF200, again, showing you the amount of axons that are able to cross and transfer where the array is. In this particular case, there's no distal target. I basically ligated the nerve, and that's the reason why you don't see anything here. But the important portion is you can see the electrodes going by through this array. So the next question that we ask is, OK, so how, <clears throat> how much this, uh, disruption this array creates? And we do RT-PCR, we looked at 84 different genes. We look at genes that are involved in inflammation, in, in regeneration. Um, and what you look at here is, is basically the comparison between the REMI and an end-to-end -end repair. And basically the lines indicate uh, two standard deviation uh, modification or, or changes. And what you see is most of the blue circles fall in this, uh, basically within that range. So most of these genes do not change whether you have a REMI or whether you're looking at an end to repair. And the same is true when you have a tumorization repair. So there are, uh, from these studies, we concluded that the REMI is not really um, inducing major changes, at least not molecularly, that we can detect. All right, so when you have an interface, so can you connect it and record and stimulate? This is the preparation. The REMI is connected through a wire that goes under the skin and is uh, connected to an external uh, Omnetrics connector, which then is plugged into a plexon amplifier and brings the signals into a computer that we can then use to observe that. This is what happens and that, that was a little bit of a surprise for us. I was under the understanding and being not a, an electrophysiologist, was, that's probably why I was in the, in the misunderstanding that neurons will be silent as they grew and they'll only become active after they find their target, but that's not, ex not what we saw. This is day seven. Now, if you know what I just, if you remember what I just told you, I just cut the nerve. There is a blood clot. There is a lot of, all the immune cells that you can imagine are gonna be there. The, 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 the electrode is gonna be coated with IgGs and macrophages and everything you can think of. Yet, I can see action potentials as, spontaneous action potentials as early as seven days, which increase dramatically uh, and to the, uh, the, the following week. You can see single units or multiple units. Some of these units are as large as, as 800 microvolts, really, really large. We do that, you can observe that these early units in acute um, preparations. This is just a principal component analysis showing different, that these indeed are two different units or chronically as well. Now, over time, they still tend to, at least in this initial study, 
uh, some of them tend to, dis uh, to reduce in amplitude. So we still have the issue of there's some um, coding perhaps that may be limiting the, um, uh, the ability of these electrodes to record over time. In order to study that with a little more, more detail, we got a support from DARPA and, and looked at more animals. The first study was about 12 animals. In this case, we had at close to 100. What you see here is the days of implantation, and each one of these is, is the recording that we take from different animals. And basically, you're looking at a single to noise ratio. As you see early on, you get about five. So that's pretty, that's a five to seven. It's a pretty good number. And that reduced a little bit, well, it goes to six to five, and it's maintained over time for the most part until 42 days, which most, at, at, at that time, at 42 days, most of these interfaces fail, and most of the failures are catastrophic, and most of them are due to pedestal detachment and wire breakage. In order to be sure um, if that was basically the case, then we come up with a couple of strategies. First of all, we said, okay, if we plug and unplug, because we're measuring every week, right, that puts stress into the wires, and that puts stress into the connector, and that's why things fail. What if we don't touch the animal for basically 40, uh, it was intended to do uh, to, to be two months, but basically this one survived 49 days. And then at that time, we, what we did then is don't touch the, uh, don't take any recording, look at 49 days and then plug and see what you, we can uh, observe, thinking maybe we can go beyond that 42 days. The other strategy that we tried was to um, uh, not have the connector exposed. So we have the connector, covered and implanted subdermally, wait for 110 days, resurface the connector, and at that moment take the, the measurements. In, this, in both of these cases, we're able to get extended recordings, and the most important thing is the single to nose ratio did not change. We did more experiments after that. We stretched the limb. We did a lot of other experiments that uh, convinced us to the, to the uh, at least, <laughs> to our satisfaction that this electro interface is, is stable. You can pull it, you can stretch it, and the recordings before and after do not change. We then try to use this interface, and instead of taking recording uh, measurements from a mixed nerve, we went into uh, the branches of the sciatic nerve. This is a cross-section of the sciatic nerve, and the sciatic nerve divides into tibial, common, peroneal, sural, and there's the branches are indicated there. And the sural is primarily sensory, the tibial is primarily motor, here is an uh, acetylcholine transferase staining, and you can see that most of the motors are, are here, even though there's some that you can uh, still, uh, not motor, but you can see some uh, staining in the sural nerve. What we did then is to put remis in the tibial, remis in the sural, and see if we can actually identify different patterns, different activities in those two nerves. The way to do that, we, we come up with a dual remi, we have a CIF connector that we developed with Plexon, and that allow us to do these, these recordings. The second thing that we did was to have a, more, a, a little bit of a better behavioral assay. We have these rats walking on treadmill so that we can actually analyze their gait and um, kind of pair their gait to, the idea was to pair the gait to the uh, neurogram. And basically that starts a little slow and hopefully later it advances a little bit better. So with that tool, we then take the, okay, what is happening? There. So we took some measurements, and this is an example of what we got. There are three channels that are showing there, and this is the baseline um, recordings that we obtained when the rat is standing, but the treadmill is off. And what you see is that the channel two has a little more of a tonic activity. Channel one is not too much active. There's a little bit of activity, but there's a barely over the noise level, and sa same to with channel three. But as soon as you turn off the treadmill, then you can clearly see uh, bursts of spikes or bursts of activity and examples of some of them really large uh, single spikes. So is this activity sensor, sensory in nature? Is this proprioceptive? Is this mechanoceptive? Or is it motor? What is it, right? We still, uh, even though you're in a tibial nerve, you still get information that is mixed. In order to be a little bit certain, again, when you get the kinematic analysis and you try to pair and correlate with a the neurogram, then we realize that in a single step cycle, the red being the heel strike from, and this being one step, most of the neurogram activity precedes the heel strike, all right? And this actually is very characteristic from where we have observed it's between four and six spikes, the inter-spike interval is between 20 and seven. So this actually correlates very nicely with motor activity. 
But in order to be completely certain that that is the case, what we did was to inject the animal with Botox. The Botox will do a chemical denervation. If, there is, if this is neural activity, you still record it, right? But the, 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 the afferent information will be transmitted. You can record that, but the muscle will not contract. So it cannot be proprioceptive because the muscle will not contract. And um, before and after Botox treatment, basically there's no difference. And this is one of them in, in our lab, in our hand, this is the best proof that we have that, in, that we can record and characterize at least find uh, motor activity in uh, using the REMI. Um, I'm gonna now change into sensory. Um, and this is, again, going to be something that is old and I haven't incorporated the, the res recent literature, recent reports, and I know here both Dustin and, and Paul do great job uh, in, in these areas. But basically what the motivation, I, I told you about recording uh, motor information. What about sensory and stimulating sensory uh, percepts? Okay, so the motivation comes from sensorized processes, which um, up to very recently, and uh, some groups were using these um, actuators, how you call these things, is, anyway, an actuator to, to press into the skin to be able to uh, alert the, the user of, of a particular pressure in the hand. Um, ideally, you want to stimulate, or to stimulate the nerve directly and elicit perception. And that's something that uh, Dustin Taylor demonstrated in about two months ago, uh, at least published. And it was fantastic, right? You can, you can stimulate, you can model, put a sinus wave and, and elicit change percepts from uh, paresthesias to precise touch and pressure. Our thought was, uh, was different and started differently. Uh, our thought is more influenced from the biology point of view. So about different, so and the idea comes because um, the composition of those nerves, as I said, it's very heter heterogeneous. We have about seven different types of sensory fibers. All of them are different in diameter, in myelination content, and conduction velocity. This is one motor axon. And these axons are all innervated at specific uh, sensors. And it's the combination of these sensors that are activated when you touch something or when you move and stretch your hand that gives you the, the natural uh, sense of perception. The first thing that we did was to try to understand um, what types of percepts can you record using the REMI? That was the first thing that we did. In order to do that, we, having the ability to record from a freely moving animal, we tried two specific tests. The thermal uh, nociceptive test, by which you put the animal into a cage that has a clear glass underneath, you put an IR source, you heat the paw, from zero to 55 degrees, 55 degrees is painful, the animal will withdraw the pole, lick its paw if it is too painful. And then you can record at the same time from those animals and see what's happened. This is an example of a tonically activated channel. This is frequency in spikes. Even though we apply thermal stimulation, nothing happened in this channel. This one, we will not even record in anything completely. So that is to say that we haven't been too lucky to get these thermal uh, fibers so far. but. Mechanoceptives are a completely different thing. For test, to test mechanoceptive fibers, you have this bone fray test. This is a mechanically one that takes a, a metallic rod through a mesh and hits the paw and puts pressure that varies from zero to 50 grams. And in this case, you get one of the channels which uh, increases the firing in uh, the rate of firing just before the animal licked its paw. So that is consistent with a mechanoceptive fiber, which actually decreases completely its activity once the animal lifts the pole, therefore releasing the stimulus. This channel, on the other hand, increases the frequency dramatically when the animal lifts the pole. So this is more consistent with either um, motor or proprioceptive. So we start finding examples that we can use to recognize or identify different modalities. I'm gonna give you a Example, and I hope you can listen to this or hear the video. Um, and first, let me describe what you're going to see. This is basically a video that demonstrates the bone fray assay. The animal, this is the pole that we had the um, uh, Remy implanted in. The connector is right here. And we're going to bring a probe underneath, and you'll see this pole being lifted. That's, uh, that correlates with an increase in frequency, and I hope you can hear the increased clicking or a recording in, in action potentials. Now what the animal does after that is stops and it looks directly to, to you, right? At that moment, the, the noise will stop. 
And what I think is interesting about this video is that then the, the animal, then you can hear then the action potential is coming back before the animal realizes it's painful. So the animal is still walking, looking at you. We still record, we record the signals, and then the animal looks uh, at, the, at the paw and start licking the paw, which then increases uh, activity by self-stimulation. And it stops. Here it comes. I hope it was clear, was it? A little bit? No? So in general, we have been observing this type of patterns using those type of approaches. We have the regular tonic, the regular uh, bursting uh, units, and some irregular firing. The, the, the idea here and the, the goal eventually will be to characterize the type of activity that you can see in regenerative type of interfaces and ask questions as, um, that are to us interesting in terms of is this activity uh, similar to uh, those who are not injured, uh, if you were to have a REMI with no target, is this activity patterns will be the same? Can you elicit uh, similar sensations using this type of uh, pattern activity? So just an example of the, the other types of experiments that we do, we basically can use, use a brush or air or something, just do that. This is on, on a sural uh, REMI interface, and you, clearly, you can clearly see the activity going in, in and out, um, increase and decrease of, uh, after you apply the stimulation. So we can record more activity. We can record um, as well uh, sensory information. But if we stimulate from the REMI uh, in the hopes of eliciting a specific sensory percept, uh, I thought we had a problem. And the problem is that at least in the rat, we have 27,000 axons. Uh, two thirds of those axons are sensory, one third are motor. And when you looked at the, their distribution, they're, they're all distributed, uh, they're all mixed. Even more mixed after you cut them, as they regenerate, uh, they're all mixed. And this is the, this is the, the data that shows that. That's a, the asterisk shows one of the areas where our electrode was. And this is P0 showing, or um, this is S100 showing the myelinated axons, and this is calcitonin gene-related peptide, a pain fiber marker, and so they're well mixed. So if I were to, to stimulate this, you know, probably the large myelinated fibers will depolarize first, but chances are I'm gonna get also at some point the, the ones that I don't want to get. Moreover, if I want to stimulate motor, um, if I want to stimulate mechanoceptors, uh, well, they're all the mechanoceptive fibers are the same diameter, the same myelinated, have the same amount of myelin, so I will probably be uh, hard pressed to evoke a uh, particular type of mechanics in session over another subtype, right? And uh, it, that's the way I, at least I think about it from the electrical point of view. One possible approach to, to address this issue is to look at the, um, at the molecular and developmental differences between these neurons. Here, it show, this, this drawing shows you that the fact that the dorsal root ganglion neurons that innervate the skin are really different. When you look at these cells, you, you and apply a couple of stainings. This is NF52, which is a, a neurofilament for large neurons. You can see that the large proprioceptive cells are clearly labeled. But then if you look at CGRP, only really the small and probably some of the medium cells are labeled, so, and there's no overlap. And when you look at uh, receptors and other markers, that is exactly the case. These cells are not, are, are not similar. And the other thing that you see is they're all intermingled. They're still mixed, so stimulating directly to the DRG may work, but also may have the same problem of eliciting multiple cell types. When you look at the motor neurons, it's the same thing. Uh, if you use a uh, H&E stain or initial stain, they all look the same, but if you look at the molecular markers, they're all different. So perhaps if you use the difference between them, you can segregate them. And in fact, that's what happens during development. The neurons here in red are sensory, the, um, the green ones are motor. And uh, Tom Jessel and others have 
uh, identify molecules like efferins and F receptors that are expressed in sensory and motor axons which mediate repulsion and, uh, and allow these things to be segregated. And, and there are other factors that contribute for nerves that are completely mixed. This is a GFP labeled mouse at the level of the spinal roots all the way to the level of segregated sensory and motor branches. And you can see the motor branch beautifully segregated. And it's a, it's a, it's a process, right? It goes from proximal to, to distal. So the molecules that, in, that allow that to happen, are, some of those have been identified. We learn the identity of these molecules from developmental biology. We know that the slits, the reference, the netrins, the, uh, and the list is here, and this is just a partial list, are contribute to that nerve guidance. Uh, we know a lot of how that, those signals are interpreted by the axons, and we know that some of those are attractants, some of those are repellents, and some attach to the ground, to the ECM, and some, some really release as, um, into the extracellular matrix. I'm going to concentrate on our work using the neurotrophins. The neurotrophins is a group of growth factors that stimulate the growth and the survival of neurons. And there are at least uh, five flavors that bind to three receptors. Well, this is also another four receptors. But these three are highly specific. These are the receptors. These are the ligands. And what you can see is that I'm oh, sorry, these are receptors, these are di dimers. We see that NGF is very specific for track A, and BDNF is very specific to track B, and so on. Moreover, um, if you have a injury situation, and this is a cartoon of the dorsal spinal cord, and these are the DRGs. Uh, here we illustrate two sides. The blue ones are, purple ones, are going to be the proprioceptive ones that uh, innervate the ventral motor neurons, and these two are going to be your pain fibers and that innervate the lamina too here. After a dorsal root injury, these axons regenerate in the periphery and stop right here. They're un incapable of growing into the spinal cord because the spinal cord is inhibitory. Now, if you re-express, so this is an injury model that I did in a number of years ago. If you re-express these growth factors in an adult, with the idea of now providing back these growth factors, are these neurons are able to grow back into the spinal cord? And the answer is absolutely yes. These are pictures of controlled vectors with LAC-C. This is a picture with NGF expressing vector. L1 is a cell adhesion molecule, and FGF. And this is a higher magnification of what you see here. If you express NGF for nerve growth factor, thousands of these neurons in the adult are going to find the the NGF, what they really like, is like putting candy for kids. They find it and they go for it and they expand and, and collateralize. That actually gave us an idea. Can we actually use this growth factor to guide, not only to attract, but can you actually guide them? So can you, put a, can you make a track from one hemisphere of the brain to the other, make a 90 degree turn and give it a target? So we did that with NGF and uh, L1 um, Virus, these are the areas that we injected the virus, and the virus are injected into astrocytes, and astrocytes release these growth factors. Then we grafted DRGs. DRGs don't grow in the, in the brain, obviously, these, and they don't even belong to the brain, but we did that just to prove the point that these neurons like NGF. And the idea was, what can they go and, and follow the track? And, and they do, they actually do. These are the implanted um, DRGs. They go across the brain, along the corpus callosum, and right into the corypotamen. So this demonstrates that growth factors can be used to guide. Moreover, then can you actually, it happens in the, in the CNS, but can you actually guide axons that are injured in the peripheral nervous system? These are the different types of neurons, and this is what they like, and the different receptors that they bear. This is just a ch picture just showing that there are different neurons labeled with different things. These are track C proprioceptors. So George Smith, my postdoctoral mentor, did an experiment a couple of years ago, and what he did, he took a, he took a femoral nerve with normally branches into, into a motor and a sensory branch. He injured proximally, and if you do that, these axons that were normally nightly segregated, they mixed, and 50% go to here, 50% go there. But if then you inject one of the areas, in this case the cephalon nerve, which is the, uh, the sensory branch, and put a gradient of viral vectors expressing NGF, then from a complete mixed uh, population, you enrich sensory fibers. This is adding NGF, and these are sensory branch over motor branch. So you can get a, a two-fold increase. You basically enrich axons to that compartment. That gave us this thought. Maybe we can get a severed nerve in an amputee. We perhaps can actually have different channels expressing different growth factors. We can compartmentalize this, 
these uh, axons by sensory modality type or sensory versus motor and be able to have a molecularly defined neural prosthetics. Well, that was the idea, and it was a kind of a crazy idea, but first you need to show that it works. Lucky for us, we have examples of DRGs that respond differently to these growth factors, but they respond dramatically different that you can actually see if, if the type of neuron that you're looking at. NGF in DRGs induce long and branched axons. NT3 produce short, highly branched axons. We, create, we develop an uh, in vitro assay and show that we can have a couple of molecules in different branches and then put a DRG right here, okay? This gradient, this differential gradient in vitro, we can maintain only for six hours, six to eight hours. It's the most, the most we can do. And, and for this experiment, I use recombinant proteins. Buy the, the, the proteins, mix it with collagen, and, pre and present it at the end, right here, as a target. If you do that, this is a DRG. This is NGF, that's NT3, and I guess you can clearly see the difference between those axons. These are long and branch. These are short and branchy. And if you do the proper stainings, you realize that beta tooling labels everything, but CGRP only labels the pain fibers, and the pain fibers are growing only towards the NGF. They're definitely not growing at all towards the NT3. And it's exactly the same DRG. I mean, all the neurons are there. They just choose to go to one side of the assay. We then took this uh, into in vivo experiments. This is our controls, right? If you take a, a uh, simple tube and put a mixed nerve on the other side, you get a simple nerve growth, uh, regenerated nerve. If you then make a Y-shaped tube and attach a sural and tibial, then the tibial nerve attracts more axons than the sural, but you get proportionally nerve regeneration in that assay. If you then put it, the Y-shaped tubes with nothing, only collagen but no growth factors, then really nothing grows in it. Uh, you see something in there, there's no axons, it's basically mostly uh, fibroblasts and Schwann cells. But then if you fill these arms with NGF and NT3, then you get a little bit more. It's not like normal, but it's definitely better than that one. So you're still getting axonal content, and you can actually count them and visualize them. This is CRP going, showing that in this particular assay, as an example, how the sural attracts mostly sensory compared to the tibial. The tibial attracts mostly more compared to the sural, and NT3 gets more of the um, motor slash proprioceptive um, markers. You can quantify that. Now, in the first experiment, we did NT3 versus NGF. That was the only thing we did, and we used recombinant proteins. This is the common arm. Nothing is different. This is the left and the right arm. When you compare tibial versus NT3, the tibial arm is better to segregate. The tibial did a little, the NT3 did a little bit, but not significantly uh, different. Well, it's, well, it is significant, but not that much. The sural uh, did not, and these are CGRP fibers. The sural is, gives you a very good segregation for sensory fibers, but the NGF did not. And that was a huge surprise for us. But when we look at the motor, it's different. Again, this common arm doesn't have any difference. You go to the uh, left and right, or A and B, the TBL gives you good segregation, and NT3 gives you the exactly same segregation. So NT3 was very, very good. NGF, as expected, did not allow, did, did not induce a lot of growth. So that was in the middle, right? It seems that we were going after something, but maybe we didn't have the right combination. That's what I thought. So maybe we didn't have the right way of providing sustained drug release. So we went ahead and got a little more funding, uh, create, uh, make. Uh, PLGA particles allowed, uh, which allow us to get a little more of sustained release, show that our particles can produce as much growth as the recombinant proteins. This is basically a DRG showing growth by GDNF. Get, a, get a several groups in, in here. I tried pleiotrophins like PTN, NGF, BDNF, GDNF, NT3, and, and these ones alone. And the first experiment was to compare against BSA. Was BSA being a non-descriptive uh, molecule. This is how the experiment looks. We implanted, we severed the sciatic nerve, we implanted the Y um, tube. In this case, we don't have electrodes, okay? That's, I'm gonna tell you that the first men have no electrodes in there. But what it has is we cap the ends. So here we have an agarose plug of 3% agarose, so nothing is coming out of that tube. In order to evaluate whether or not this will work, we put fluoro gold at the end in one of the arms and be able to track trace sensory and motor axons. This is an example of your 
uh, motor neurons. You can, now you know how many motor neurons went into that arm. And the same thing is, is going into the DRG. In the DRG, however, you can actually not only get numbers of sensory neurons, but you can get modalities by the size. This is a large proprioceptive neuron. That's a proprioceptive neuron. This, these are two mechanoceptive neurons, and that's a nociceptive neuron based on size, OK? Because they're, they're dramatically different. So you can count them separately. All right. Then at the end of the experiment, we did conduction velocities in that segment. So we took the, the, the um, dissect out the wide, removed the tube, put a recording electrode here, simulated an electrode there, and, be able, and identify motor proprioceptive fast, medium, and the slow conducting fibers that way. This is the result. And, and this is partially, um, we still have to complete more groups, but this is something I can show you at the moment. BSA is not discriminative, right? So you have about 50% 50, 50 sensory, uh, about 42% uh, motor, and this is the average of six animals. These are the way they break out in small, medium, and large um, sensory. And this is their conduction velocities in average of those. Uh, so you have a mix of everything. Now, with one of the growth factors, we can get 60% motor and a reduced percentage of sensory. Now, notice that it's not perfect, right? But the conduction velocities, and the conduction velocities are also not appropriate. You would like to see a little more uh, fast conducting fibers here. But the point is that we can get enriched, you can reach axons here, and you can actually do the opposite as well. You can get, with another growth factor, you can get up to 87% of sensories. And so we're in the process of investigating uh, you know, and getting data, not only for conduction velocity uh, track tracing, but also from EM at the distal nerve, at the distal, at the regenerate end, to see what is the composition. So in short, I think that the idea that we have, and we still, I guess, um, need to prove that fully, is that you can define uh, new interfaces molecularly, so that if I were, if I have an interface in which I control what is in there, if I stimulate this one, I will very much assure you that we're going to get most of those. Uh, we're going to get a lot of percepts, and, and if we can modulate the type, we can probably even define the, the type of percept that you're going to have, and compared to this one. So the the idea will be that stimulating and recording from these interfaces will give you different results. We're moving forward on that by developing better ways to, to create gradients. What I just showed you was results using particles. So the particles were equally distributed. So there's no gradient there. That's not, that's not how neurons grow. Neurons like gradients. So what we did is to develop a way to create a three-dimensional gradient. And I only have one slide for that in this, in this talk. But basically, this is the idea. This is a macro channel that is filled with recombinant protein and collagen. You, that was the first type of uh, strategy that you, we used. The second one, we add uh, macro particles to release growth factors over a longer time. And the newer one is we create this, this coil, that uh, fiber that releases growth factors over time in three dimensions, but also it has a nice gradient conformation. We did a little modeling to, to understand what will be the diffusion dynamics. Uh, what will be the concentration difference and how that will mod modulate over time. And we did in vitro experiments to show how these neurons will grow. And this is a, a micro channel. It's a 250 micron channel filled with collagen that has these coils on the, uh, on the walls. These are growth factor, uh, these are DRG fibers growing through them. And if you don't have a gradient, these neurons make decisions and they look for short distance cues. So they go from one coil to the next to the next. So they do a lot of uh, turning. If you provide a gradient, they are pretty much grow straight and longer and in large, larger numbers. So just to conclude what I told you in this part, and I have two parts, so the, the second will be faster. We have this Remy uh, interface that provides, provide, uh, provides an open frame uh, new interface that we believe is, is, um, is stable. We can add growth factors to entice and also to segregate, and perhaps you can allow at some point to have molecularly defined interfaces. And, and the idea is that this will increase, uh, at some point, the ability to provide better natural control and better natural feeling of, uh, for upper limb prosthetics. So I'm going to change quickly to neuromodulation and tell you what we've done in terms of interfacing small nerves. 
the examples, you know them, but there is a lot of interest, both commercially and as well as scientifically, in, ter in terms to um, stimulate nerves in the periphery to, create, to, to achieve a clinical uh, benefit. And particularly the vagus nerve stimulation has all types of conditions uh, in already approved for clinical use and as well as being investigated in clinical trials. We uh, then, uh, last year, I think, Glasgow Smith Klein came with this challenge of um, you know, advancing the, the technology to create smaller interfaces that can record, stimulate, and block nerve activity, specifically in uh, autonomic nerves, uh, nerves that innervate organs that are important for the clinic, the adrenal gland, the spleen, the spleen and so on. So we were lucky to be invited. So I you know, went to the first meeting. I came back thinking, uh, how, the, how can we do that? And uh, by then, I had the idea of, of an electrode that I fabricated. And I wanted to test that in a system. And the system that I, that I chose uh, is, is this one. It's acupuncture. And the reason why I chose acupuncture is because, uh, first of all, I, you know, there was a little bit of, in my mind, there was a controversy whether it works or not. And if it works, what is the mechanism? So. Um, I've, I've been looking at some of those acupuncture points. Some of them lay very nicely on top of nerves. If, if you're a neuroscientist, or, or you, can, you can see some of these points clearly falling on top of a particular major nerve. Some of the ones may not, but some of them do. And then I came across about this study. This is a clinical uh, double-blind study that was conducted very recently in which they took a concussion hypertense group, took it to China to receive five to six um, acupuncture uh, sessions to reduce their blood pressure, their hypertension. This is the blood pressure. Oh, by the way, these are the, the aqua points that they use. And there are like 10 places that they put needles. And, and the control was also very good. They choose other points that, so they also, the controls also have needles, but supposedly in places that will not affect blood pressure. Now, this is the result. You know, after immediately post treatment, there was a, a, a good depressor response of this treatment which came back progressively after they stopped the treatment. So this, to me, at least, in, th that was a very good evidence that um, acupuncture can actually indeed lower the blood pressure. All right. So, but can you do that from a single acupoint? And moreover, can you do that from a fascicle, if it's indeed a nerve, which is mediating the result? This is the ST36 point, which is the one that I choose. And if you look at that, uh, Susan Lee point uh, is right there near to the common peroneal nerve. So when you look at the human common peroneal nerve, you have 25 to 38 fascicles. So, all right, so do you need all the points? Do you need all the fascicles? Or can you get away with a particular fascicle? I'm getting close to the, to the end. This basically shows the um, electrode that we design. It's a microchannel electrode. It has 16 channels on both walls, so a total of 32. We have a middle die that interconnects the top die with the bottom die, so you can actually access all the electrodes down here and, and bond them. And you place the nerve in the middle with the idea of having an easy uh, way to access the nerve and then close it so you can amplify the signal by the microchannel architecture. That was done in collaboration of uh, Dr. Kim and uh, Mutu at Utari. This is a picture of the electrode. We ask Microprose to wire um, the electrode to an Omnetrix connector. This is a picture of the electrode. And this is how an explanter nerve looks like. In this case, this microchannel electrode is about uh, 200 microns. But we can change that up to 50 if you change the middle die. You compare, we compare the noise levels with a uh, nano cough. This is a cough. That's a Utari. So it has reasonably good uh, noise levels. Obviously, the electrode size are, are also smaller. And then we did the following experiment. These are pictures that show how we took the peroneal nerve in a rat and you know, take all the fascicles that we can see. We took the, what I identify as a deep um, peroneal nerve fascicle, and it's right here. I placed it over the group of the, of the utari. And I did um, ele uh, hook electrode stimulation and recording. That's the recording from that electrode. And you can actually record that from multiple electrode points at the same time. And eventually, you know, this can allow you to give you con conduction velocity from, from a cough if you have a long enough cough or if you include the, the frequency sampling. And we can also do the opposite. We can simulate from the Utari and look at EMG compound uh, muscle potentials. 
All right, so experiment set, set up. We have the rats, we have the Utari, and what we decided to do is to see if that actually worked in a hypertense rat. We took, to, to, we took rats that are normal tensive, and we took SYR rats, which are genetically hypertense, and we did the following experiment. This is the baseline um, heart rate and mean arterial pressure, pressure when the electrode is on and when it's off. And you can clearly see a nice uh, pressure de uh, depressor response, which is statistically significant over uh, four, six animals that we did. These are four animals. And um, this is compared with um, the normal tensive. This is the average before and after pressure. So, all right, so it may be that uh, it seems that it's, it's going to be feasible to go into fascicles if you develop electrodes that will allow you to get there in a way that you don't damage those, those fragile small fascicles. Some of those things are really, really tiny, such as like 80 microns, so it's, it's, it's tiny. So getting needles in there or you know, getting a tie cough may be a little bit more challenging. I will end with this new development as well. Uh, we've been working with Field Troy very, very recently to test whether or not we can use their wireless stimulation to now start putting things together, right? If this works in anesthetized preparation, can you now implant a stimulator, the electrode, and leave it in the animal and, and see if that will modulate their, their blood pressure over time? This is the coil that, and, and the chip that Phil at uh, Illinois Te Institute of Technology developed with Cygenix. And um, they place that on the back end of a floating multi electrode array from microprobes. And this is the Remy, but you know, you, I took the top off because it's, it's a sign for um, intact nerves. And so then I place that over a, in this case, a sciatic nerve and just implant it and um, got really good results. You can actually, um, these electrodes with very little uh, charge, you can get currents from 3.5 microamps and get beautiful graded response. This is supposed to be a, a movie, and I apologize, I didn't bring the movie, but you can imagine how you can move a little pinky or you can move, a, you can move the entire paw. And we can do that at threshold or um, at different modalities. And the important part of this thing is that is the technology. The entire device measures five millimeters. We have 16 channels and wirelessly we can stimulate. These animals are still implanted. And so we hope to get uh, more data, but uh, so far, this is working, so we can see that eventually we can pair these things with other technology. This is the other technology that uh, GSK is very in, enthusiastic about. This is a soften, softening polymer by, that was fabricated by Walter Boyd here. It's a polymer that once uh, implanted, you can fabricate it at room temperature, and if you then raise the temperature to 37, so body temperature, it will reduce its modulus 100, uh, 100 fold, 100 fold, right, to two fold. 100 times. So these are examples of electrodes that we fabricated, and this is an example of one of these folded over a sciatic nerve. We can do that over, these guys can fold over 80 micron uh, nerves with no problem, and this is just an example of um, uh, compound nerve potential recorded. We can record, obviously, and stimulate from these ones. And I think that at the end, what I want to say is that when we develop microchannel electrodes that can fit small fascicles, you can use these electrodes to interface autonomic nerves. You can actually use them to modulate um, physiology and important organs. And we can then, we can use these, these electrodes. Our, our current work is, is aimed at optimizing the type of signals, the type of stimulation parameters that you need to get uh, a better response. And our goal is to get, uh, to show the, the effect on, on this uh, chronic stimulation in implanted animals using wireless. And with that, I just want to thank the work uh, that my students, um, students are, are here. The work that I presented primarily from BD Decide, Sanjay Anand, um, Jennifer Seifer, which is not here, um, Rafael Granja, and Aswini Kenaganti, which is not there as well. They're all listed here. Uh, my collaborators both here, uh, Plexon is, is an incredible uh, asset for us, being there in Texas, in Dallas. Um, and alumni that in, in my lab and the sources of funding. And, and with that, I thank you for your attention and I um, welcome any questions that you may have. So what's the distance that you, oh, I'm sorry. No, please follow go ahead. Well, oh, what's the distance that your coils, the actual gap that you can feel, that you can cross with the coils? Uh, four, four centimeters. Uh, I will present more of that in the next talk. <laughs>
four, four centimeters. I tried five, and it doesn't work with, well, I, I, let me, let me. No, with, with the coils, I haven't tested the coils. With particles, four. With the coils, I'm hoping to do a, even larger, larger gaps. With, with particles, four centimeters, I can, I can, I can induce them to grow. So, oh. okay, so the bottom line is this may be a stupid question. Correct, I asked it. But at one point, you did, uh, when you put the Carrari in, and you got essentially all motor unit activity, right? You had the same, uh, and, and, and now, they, but I don't understand why you didn't see any sensor activity. I mean, why there, the, 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 did it? But we were not looking for it. In that particular experiment, we were just focusing to identify motor from the sensor. One of the things that I wanted to use for my own understanding was to see if the signals that you can record from both motor and sensor were slightly different, right? I was uh, naive enough to, to believe, and, and I may be still thinking that it may be a possibility uh, of thinking that there are um, different signatures between electrical activity from sensory fibers and motor fibers. So in, in those experiments, what you're seeing is selected examples of what I know is motor, and selected examples of what I know is sensory. But uh, I have 18 electrodes, so yeah, absolutely. One of those is recording sensory, and some of those are recording motor. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then you can just put a coil out and do spike-triggered averaging, okay? I mean, you don't have to, it would seem like you could select them out right away. Well, the recording portion, I think you're, you're right, is the stimulation portion that I, I was more concerned about. Yes? Uh, very interesting. I was curious on the regeneration. Do you have a sense of, do you think the, the percentage of regenerating fibers you're going to get, so if I have a nerve and full coverage and then I do the regeneration, what percentage of those are going to come back and need to have access to? And then will the coverage be uniform across the hand, or you know, what do you expect? If you were to translate this forward or even do the whole physiological experiment on the rat, how much of that surface did you cover? Right. So that's a, that's a good question. There are some, there's some really old literature that says that about 50% of the neurons will die after an injury and not regenerate. That is actually very true if you use, in, if you injure uh, neurons close to their cell bodies and particularly if you injure neurons in neonate, uh, neonates or embryos, well, neonates. Uh, in an adult, however, if you have chronic injuries, and you provide the proper growth factors like GDNF and BDN, BDNF, uh, Tisa Gordon has shown that you can get most of the neurons to regrow. There's no difference. So now the current thinking is that you can, given the, the proper um, nutrients of, of uh, signals, you can get all of those motor neurons and sensory neurons to regrow. Now, maybe all is a, it's a strong word. Maybe you get a, a large percentage of them. So I think that regeneration will not be an issue. Now. Uh, as I be became more and more uh, knowledge about the, the, the problem, and I became aware of the difficulty that this approach entails, is um, it's going to require, require more additional strategies to be able to achieve uh, segregation. So number one, I have, an, I have a chamber. I have two chambers, right? And I invited, I invite, that's the way I think, I invite some accents to come over for drinks, and I provide some nice drinks for them. But I also have peop, uh, fibers that I did not invite. They just happen to be going in that direction. So in order to, I need to block them. I need to use an inhibitor. And that's one of the current strategies that I'm doing in my lab to prevent some of those things from getting in. So uh, what I'm telling you is that I, while I think that this study is, is viable, I don't think we have the right uh, combination yet. And it's, so it's not ready for either physiological studies or, or prime time. But I think that eventually it may work. Um, my, the, the challenge that I, I want to test, and it's just, again, for my personal uh, curiosity, uh, satisfaction, is, is to see if you can, if you can get mechanoceptor subtypes uh, or mechanoceptors from proprioceptors and, and be able to separate mechanoceptor subtypes using proper growth factors. And, and it will require more than growth factors. It will require ECM molecules and it will require other things. But uh, according to what I know and what I see developmentally, uh, you can use specific molecules to achieve that. Drinks. Are they going to still stay in the clicks? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. That's a fantastic question. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you that the EM that I've seen from the fragments that I regenerated, they, they look fant fantastically normal. It looks, they look really, really good. Are they going to stay there after the growth factors uh, disappear? I don't know. That's a good question. Organized, or you think the fibers are going to 
mixer. Right. I, I do expect them to stay around, to stay there. I, they once they grow that distance, this is a, a three millimeter segment that they have to grow. It's going to be difficult, I, in my opinion, for them to turn around, go back to the to the um, center, the common arm, and, and look around. But um, it's, it's a concern. I, I don't know. I expect them to be. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Or something goes to the fingertip, another part goes to the part of the hand. When you regenerate them, do you think they'll maintain that organization so the fibers in the same part of the hand go the same area, or are they going to become mixed? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I, by looking at some of the Paul's results uh, recently, I think that, uh, I don't know. Uh, it seems that when in some of the TMR experiments, they do uh, maintain certain, despite the fact they have the chance to, to grow randomly. It's a very good question. Uh, if, if that fails, if I'm unable to do that, then this, this strategy will probably not work as well. But I don't know. It's a very good question. The perineurium, when you do the cotton and regrow, do you see perineurial growth? Yeah. Or something? yeah. So yeah. You, did, you regenerate a fasciculo organ yeah. structure? I think I saw it in your first slide. Yes. You the first slide is. So, so you get a perineurium sort of around the yeah. fibers that separate the, even yeah. the ones you have there, the fibers grow, there's a perineurial layer. All still around the fibers, right? Yes, and in fact, um, yeah, we're investigating actually the role of the uh, peripheral nerve blood barrier uh, and how that contributes perhaps to signal um, signal detection over time and so on. But you're right that, that, that it takes about two months for that perineum to reseal, but it does reseal. So your your electrons still are outside the perineum. That doesn't come and grow around the human inside. Is that right? There is no perineum between. It, it's not perineum between the needle or the electrode and the axons it, that I can see. There is not. There is not. It forms outside. Okay. Why that happens, I, I don't know. So in the outside, it reforms and seals, but not. So you have mini fascicles, and the mini fascicle has a, a perineum like layer. But between the electrode and the axons, I couldn't see any, any perineum. Can you speculate on? the number of contacts you'll be able to get in there or the density of electrons you can put in because you were also pointing out that axons seem to have a minimum distance away that they go from right. the electrode. Right, so this was a 400 uh, micron inter electrode spacing that we use. Uh, we also have used a 200 electrode, um, 200, 200 micron inter space electrode at uh, FMAs and they also work quite well. I, I don't know. That's another open question. Uh, there is a limit, obviously, as to how many things can do. And eventually, if you block axon growth, then, then axonal growth, uh, they may all uh, stop altogether, right? So um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. How many can you put? I, my, the way I see these things, instead of packing a lot of electrodes in a highly, in a small area, I like to think that you can basically have multiple of these things placed and, and either along the same fascicle or different branches, different fascicles. That's the way I, I think about it, yes. Dominic. Were you able to record spontaneous activity with a second electrode and a second part of your talk? That's a really good question. No, not yet. Not yet. So we're, uh, but the caveat to that answer is that I used gold electrodes in my first iteration. We're now using uh, silicon carbide electrode and, and um, uh, iridium oxide coatings. So if we increase the, the, the uh, sensitivity of those electrodes, we may. But no, not right now. Sensory uh, spontaneous activity, we haven't seen it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mario. Thanks a lot. And um, this is a fantastic talk. And in appreciation of you coming out to join us, we have from the FES Center the Cleveland Architecture book, which thank I have to say so is a very cool book. I bought it from my mother, who is retired general contractor. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is from the APT Center. Thank, 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 okay. thank you so much. Thank you very much. I hope it's not because of the age, but thank you so much. <laughs>